Hey, 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 I am Chelsea. I'm so glad that you're here at Church Home. Welcome, we're so glad that you are here. Hey, since I have to introduce myself, can you introduce yourself? And if you're watching in a room with a group of people, introduce yourself to them. If you're watching online, either on YouTube or on the app, introduce yourself in the chat. And here is what we want to know. We wanna know your name, where you're currently at, and also what city you were born in and bonus points for if you can remember the hospital name where you were born. I'm Chelsea Smith. I was born in Portland, Oregon in the United States of America, and I was born at a Ladies of Providence Hospital, but I don't remember the exact name. I should have called my mom to prepare because I'm sure she remembers. She did a lot of work that day, you know, but welcome to Church Home. We're so glad that you're here, and I'm really excited to spend these next few moments with you because as I was thinking and preparing, I realized I had a lie in the back of my mind that I grew up with. I don't really know where it came from. And the story of the disciples at the end of Jesus' life in Matthew 26 completely blows the lid off of this lie that I believed. And I'm hoping that it uh, tells the truth to you too, that it can free some of us of some things that possibly we have believed that are not truthful in our lives. So here we go. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 26. But first, I want to tell you what the lie is. Here's what it was for me. Growing up, I don't know where it came from. You know those things that you believe that you just don't know where the belief come, came from? I believed that if I did something wrong, then my life was determined to live second best. Not like a little thing wrong, not like a little lie, not like, you know, a little indiscretion, but oh my gosh, if I was to have sex before I got married, then I was going to have second best husband and second best sex life for the rest of my life. Or if I ever cheated on a test, if I ever cheated on my homework, then goodness gracious, I was going to have second best in a career my whole life. And as I got older and grew up in church and I met people who had, you know, crazy past and didn't all these things that I didn't do out of fear, not out of faith or out of love, I realized that maybe those things aren't exactly true. But I don't think I realized how much this lie kind of got deep onto the inside of me. Until a few mornings ago, I was doing my good old daily Bible reading plan. And I was reading and I came across the story in Matthew 26. And I was spending time with Jesus that morning, honestly dealing with some regret, dealing with some thoughts of, oh, something that had happened the day before that I thought I was I, you know, I thought I'd grown out of or I was never going to do again. And reading the story of the disciples in Matthew chapter 26, it is like this comedy of errors that the disciples completely and repeatedly do exactly what Jesus doesn't ask them to do, do exactly what they say they're not going to do. And the response that Jesus has towards them is really significant. The story starts out and it's in the upper room of Passover. And if you read the story of Passover in the book of John, it gives more details about what Jesus talked to the disciples about in this upper room. It's this beautiful moment where Jesus is praying for the disciples. He's prophesying over their future. He's telling them to love one another. And it's just this beautiful, like when I was a kid, we'd call them like kumbaya camp moments. Do you remember those? And it's a sacred moment that Jesus has with the disciples. But then he ends the Passover meal. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31, listen to what he says to them. It says, then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus said, but when I resurrect, you can meet me in Galilee. And of course, all of the disciples, Peter gets a bad rap for this, but all the disciples basically say to Jesus, no, no, we're never going to leave you. We're not going to happen. And Peter, who is the loudest, says, even if I have to die, I'm never going to betray you. I'm never going to leave you. And all the disciples, it says, and all the disciples said likewise. So it wasn't just Peter, it was all of them. And you know what I love? At this point in the story, Jesus is absolutely silent. Jesus doesn't answer them. Jesus doesn't go on to say, oh, that's what you say now, but let me tell you. I mean, he did tell Peter, you're going to deny me three times, then the rooster's going to crow. I I think he thought Peter needed that. But to the rest of the disciples, Jesus really leaves their good intentions there. And I find that so fascinating that even though Jesus could have kept hammering into them, oh no, you're gonna, you're gonna deny me, you're all gonna leave me, you're all gonna run away from me, he didn't. He just let it go. And you know, sometimes I think Jesus does the same thing for us in all of our good intentions. Have you ever found yourself with good intentions or 
Maybe in our country, we call them New Year's resolutions. Oh, this year I'm going to floss my teeth every day. This year, I'm not going to nag at my husband anymore. This year, I'm going to be a very patient mother and not yell at my kids to get out the door. This year, I'm not going to look at stuff I shouldn't look at anymore. This year, I'm going to be better with my money. This year, and we have all of these good intentions that we live our life by thinking, if I'm honest, and maybe it's just me, thinking that my good intentions, if I actually live them out, that's what's going to get me something good with God. That's what's going to get me first best in life. My good intentions, when I follow through on them, that's how I'm going to become a really good, nice person who does the right things. And so here the disciples are with all these good intentions, saying what they're going to do, and Jesus just I'm guessing smiles. It doesn't say what his facial expression was, but I picture him with just a teeny bit of a smirk. You know when your kids say something and you know they're wrong, but you don't want to take the time to argue with them? You just get a little, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. I, that's how I picture Jesus in this moment. So Jesus doesn't say anything about all of their good intentions. He just says, okay, come with me to the garden and pray. And in this moment, then they're walking now to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is at his lowest point that he has in his entire earthly physical life. See, we know about Jesus that even though he was fully God, he was also fully man. And so every human experience, every human emotion, every human pain, Jesus really experienced those in the same way that a human would. And so in this moment, the lowest moment of Jesus is the only time that we see him asking the disciples for anything. And in fact, he doesn't even ask all 11 of them who were left. He just grabs his, the three closest to him, Peter, James, and John, and he says, hey, my soul soul is sorrowful, even unto death. Can you imagine? Jesus said, I feel so bad. I just wish I could die right now. And in Jesus' vulnerable moment, he asked, but would you pray with me? Would you just watch and pray with me because I'm feeling really weary? So Jesus goes off not too far away, and he prays this agonizing prayer that we see recorded in the book. And then he comes back, and what does he find? The disciples, the only time he asks them for anything, are fast asleep. So what does Jesus do? He goes over, he wakes them up. He says, couldn't you, just, couldn't you just pray with me for an hour? The Spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. These incredible verses that we got on prayer. And so Jesus woke them up and said, hey, I, I need you here, guys. Can you pray with me? So sure enough, Jesus goes and it says he basically prayed the same prayer again. And do you know what happened? He comes back, they fell asleep again. And in some, some people think that this happened a third time, that the disciples couldn't even do the one thing that Jesus asked of them in his lowest point of need. So Jesus comes back the third time and they're still asleep and he says, okay, guys, come on, time, time to wake up. The, the time is at hand. So here we see Jesus being betrayed. Judas comes, gives him a kiss on the cheek. Uh, soldiers come to arrest him. And again, the disciples are whoo, trying all their good intentions, thinking they're doing the right thing. And one of the disciples cuts off one of the ears of the soldiers. And Jesus is like, whoo, what am I going to teach these guys ever right? I can honestly just see him. He literally picked up the ear, put it back on the soldier that was his ear had been cut off and healed him. And Jesus just turned the disciples and said, no, 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 this isn't the time for swords, guys. Like they're just time after time after time. They keep doing the thing they didn't say they were going to do and they keep letting Jesus down. So they didn't pray with him. They didn't understand that they weren't supposed to fight. And then eventually it says that Jesus came to the point where they took him away. And in that moment, listen to what it says in verse, in verse 56. And then all of the disciples left him and fled. Every single one of them, the very thing that they said they wouldn't do, they ended up doing. And you know, that's a really unique feeling of regret. It's one thing if you do something that you didn't want to do, but to do something that you said you would never do, to do something that you said, okay, maybe I did it once, maybe I did it twice, but I'm never going to do that thing again. And then you do it again. That is, I think, such a different level of shame of condemnation, of feeling horrible, because you said you were never going to do it again, and yet you do it. If you're in that place, can God still use you? Or is your life determined for second best? At that point in your life, are you just not just gonna get second best because I said I would never do it again, but I did it again. So here we are in the garden. Jesus is off by himself. All the disciples have left him. And then, of course, in that moment, the famous story, 
Peter denies him three times. Each time gets more and more vehement. It's like it's young girls around a fireplace. It kind of makes me very endeared to Peter that he was intimidated by a middle school girl because I also find middle school girls very intimidating. Scariest year of my life, seventh grade. It was horrible. So I, I fully understand where Peter was coming from when he denied Jesus in front of middle school girls. So Peter denies Jesus. It says Peter went off and wept. Again, the thing he said he would never go, he was never going to do. He didn't do once, he didn't do twice. He did it three times. And Peter is feeling full of regret. Has to be feeling like I can never get first best in my life ever again. And so then the way that Matthew tells the story is very interesting. And I believe that Matthew, who was the tax collector who wrote the book of Matthew, I believe he tells it this way on purpose. He gives us such a dramatic picture of what it is like as these disciples just leave Jesus, don't do what, don't do what he asked them to do, deny him, you know, do all these horrible things towards him. It's really interesting once we get to the resurrection story in Matthew, we basically get to the resurrection story. Jesus died. We get through all of that in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 28 is the resurrection story. And Jesus first sees the Marys, right? The women. And Jesus says, hey, go tell my disciples. Remember where we said we were gonna meet? We we're gonna meet up in Galilee. Go tell them I'm there. And even though other books record other interactions that Jesus had with the disciples, Matthew in the telling of Jesus that he wanted to create through his lens and just as accurate, tells it in a very unique way. There's no interaction of Jesus and the disciples until we get to the end of chapter 28 when he meets up with them in Galilee. And do you know what that tells me? That there was nothing that the disciples did that earned what we're about to see happen in Matthew 28. They didn't do anything, they didn't grovel, they didn't pay penance, they didn't have any time to get all their stuff right again so that they could earn what Jesus was about to give them at the end of Matthew 28. And this is what Jesus gives them at the end of Matthew 28. We're coming to a close here. Jesus is resurrected. And it says here, now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, right? They got that right. They remembered where Jesus told them to go. And it says, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But listen to this, but some doubted. And if you're here and you're listening and you're thinking, God can never use me or I can never get first best. I've grown up in church my whole life, but if I'm really honest with myself, I still doubt God. There's still questions in my mind about if he could really do what he said or if he actually is who he is. I still have some doubt in my mind. Can I tell you, you're in good company. Here are the disciples. They saw Jesus die, and now they are looking at his resurrected body, and it says that some of them still doubted. Can I just give you encouraging news on this, on this beautiful morning or afternoon or evening? Your doubt does not scare Jesus. Your doubt doesn't intimidate him. Your doubt doesn't mean that you are just doomed to second best your whole life. In fact, Jesus wants to embrace it. Jesus wants to talk with you about your doubt. So just be honest with him because look at what Jesus said after all of the ways that the disciples have rejected him, after all the wrong things that they have done, and even though some are still doubting while they're looking at his resurrected form, listen to the next thing Jesus said to them. He said, so all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples. If you grew up in Sunday school, you've heard this verse, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. Here it is, these disciples who did nothing to make up for the wrongs that they did to Jesus. The only thing they've done is some worshiped him and some doubted. But do you know what we find? Jesus still gave them what is called the Great Commission. In other words, hey, my plans and purposes that I had for you when you were my disciples and I called you, they haven't changed, it's the same. And can I encourage you in this moment, whatever God designed you for, whatever He destined you for, however He hardwired you, what would be your optimum fulfillment in life, just because you have made mistakes along the way, just because you have messed things up, even if you went against a direct command that Jesus gave you, like the disciples were when they fell asleep when He asked them to pray with Him. Even if you've done that, 
God's plans and purpose for, for you remain. There is not second best. Can you find a hint of second best in this verse that Jesus gave to the disciples? And listen to what he goes on to say, and I love this even more because our life isn't so much about what we do, but it's about who we do it with. Jesus said to them, and behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age that Jesus did not hold back His presence. He didn't hold back His face. He didn't hold back His smile. He didn't hold back from lo His love from these disciples just because they made mistakes, rejected Him, and disobeyed Him. That is not the Jesus who we serve. Jesus said, my presence, who I am, I am with you, and I'm with you until the end of the age. And so wherever you're at right now in this moment, can I encourage you? Jesus loves you. He wants to be with you every second of every moment of your life. And I don't know how it all works out in the kingdom economy of God, but because He knows all the things that you're gonna do and all the mistakes that you're gonna make, even like He knew the mistakes the disciples were going to make, there is no such thing as second best. You are not going to get second best in your life. No matter where you are right now, the only thing Jesus has for you is first best. And the greatest part is, is there's no story of what the disciples did to earn this. You do not have to do anything to, you know, like my air quotes, to earn God's first best. It's just a gift that we receive. So can I encourage you here this morning? Maybe some doubts have been playing in your mind over and over that I'm just gonna get second best, my life is what it is. This is just kind of what I have in life and, and you've been settling for that. No, look at what Jesus did for the disciples. Imagine what He will do for you. Can I pray for you as we conclude this morning? First of all, if you're here and uh, you'd say, you know, Chelsea, I, I, I want to know this Jesus. Maybe you've heard stories about him or you've heard he was a good teacher or you've heard he was a prophet or you've heard some things about Christianity, but you'd say, I, I want to know Jesus more. I want to know him as God. If that's you, wherever you are, with a room full of people or on the chat, you just lift up your hand and just say, I wanna know him. And that's all it takes in that moment of faith. Jesus loves you and more than anything, He wants to show the love that He has for you to you. So I wanna pray for you. And secondly, I wanna pray for people who are here this morning and wherever you are, whenever you are, and you feel like you're settling for second best. You've had a hard time believing that you could even have first best again. I'm gonna pray for you. Jesus, I thank you so much that you are real. Thank you that even though you knew all the mistakes that we we're going to make and you know all the things that we do, that you don't hold it against us. And that I pray for my brothers and sisters right now in this moment who want, to, who want to know you. Jesus, I ask that you would come flooding in with your love and that you would reveal yourself to them. Father, I pray for people who have believed a lie, that they're doomed to second best, that they're never gonna have first best in their life. Lord, I pray that you would come and you would speak life and hope and faith into every heart right now in this moment. Jesus, I know you're real. I know that you can speak to us just as clearly as you spoke to those disciples, as you met them there on that hill. You can meet us where we are. We thank you, Jesus, for your love in your name, amen. We're so grateful to get to experience these moments together. If you have questions about the message, about Jesus, or about community, reach out on Pastor Chat. We are available right now and throughout the rest of the week. You can find Pastor Chat on the website at churchhome.org chat, and you can visit the app as well. If you've said yes to Jesus and you want to further deepen your relationship with Him, we invite you to check out our daily guided prayers on the app, on the website, and on YouTube. Finally, we want to say thank you so much for your generosity. You can text GENEROSITY to 97000 to give, or you can give on the app and the website as well. Thanks so much again for coming and stopping by. We hope you have a great week.